Thank you very much. I knew I was coming to the Hanson Public Library, so I wore a vest. All right. It's the only vest I wear, own, actually. Thank you for coming out on a beautiful, beautiful fall night. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Edward. At any point, if you want to do questions, and if we have time, we'll do a Q&A at the end. Uh, but at any point, if it seems like I've lost you, throw out a question here. Um, has anyone been to the house before? <gasps> Look, oh, everyone's been to the house. A lot of people have been to the house. Thank you. Uh, so there are fans. Thank you for coming. Those of you who were dragged here, this is what I say at the house, too. Uh, those of you who were dragged here by the fans of Edward, which at the house is like 75, 80% of the people there were dragged here by the other percent, you know. Uh, they have a wonderful time. Uh, the Edward Gorey House is a fantastic uh, uh, house museum. I don't say that just because I run it. Uh, but it's all about Edward Gorey and the work that he does. And we never run out of things to do there. The house changes every year. This year, if you go to it, if you come down to it, I hear some brochures here. Uh, we're still open three days a week all the way through December. Uh, the show this year is Dressed to Kill, and it's all about Edward Gorey and fashion. If you saw the show last year, you know that it was all about Ed Edward and George Balanchine uh, and Edward's immersion into the New York City Ballet. He was addicted to the New York City Ballet. Uh, before that, that show right now uh, is in Japan touring around. Uh, they took all our snarky text and turned it into kanji, so we're really excited about that. Also, our 21 show, which was Hapless Children, is also touring. Hapless Children was all about Edward Gorey and uh, children's literature. Before that, it was, we had his notebooks. Before that, it was all about nonsense, the genre of nonsense, all this stuff. One, another one was about Agatha Christie, um, about collecting. Edward allows you to, uh oh, do we time out? Ed Ah, there we are. Sorry. Edward allows you to talk about a lot of stuff. Let me see how it happens if I go like this. There he is, Edward Gorey. Um, he is not from Massachusetts, but he spent most of his life here. Um, he was originally born in Chicago. Uh, he would live in New York and then stay with family on the Cape for much of his life until he bought his house there, which is now the museum. Um, Edward is known for a lot of things, one of which it depends how old you are. If you're in your 30s, you know him from the John Belair's books that he illustrated the covers from. Uh, if you were living in New York in the 70s, you knew him from Dracula. If you watch public television, which because you're in a library, the chances of you doing that are really good, uh, you probably know him uh, from PBS Mystery. PBS Mystery was directly a result of Dracula. Edward became famous, if we can imagine such a world. Uh, where he was famous in the late 70s, and WGBH asked him to design the animations for those. They premiered in 1980. They've been in your living room every Thursday ever since, pretty much since then. Um, a lot of people assume uh, that Edward is British and that he died a long time ago, probably in some uh, manor house under mysterious circumstances. When he passed away in 2000, people were shocked to find out that he was still alive, uh, that he was American from Chicago. Uh, people went, no, he's, he's like, he was like a friend of Oscar Wilde's or, he, he, or Bram Stoker, like he illustrated Bram Stoker's book or something, but he wasn't. Uh, he was born in Chicago, looking pretty much like that. Um, Edward was a child prodigy, maybe not apparent from that picture, um, but it is one of the few pictures of him with hair, so we do like to show it though, all right? Um, he was born in 1925. 18 months later, he did his first drawing, at least the first one that was saved. Um, his mom calls it the sausage train because that's what <laughs> Edward called it. Um, train made of sausages, train carrying sausages, we don't know, that's been lost to time. Um, he drew it from the, uh, the window of his uh, grandparents' apartment somewhere in Chicago, North Chicago. Um, a year and a half old he was when he did this. Uh, 18 months after that, he taught himself to read uh, just by looking at symbols and, and discerning that the symbols represented sounds and the sounds built words and the builds were set, built sentences and the sentences turned into stories. He was reading Agatha Christie when he was five years old. Uh, the same year he read Dracula, which was also the same year he read, uh, 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 oh, he saw the movie Dracula, uh, 1930. Um, Dracula would be a recurring motif in his life. It would make him a very wealthy man eventually. Um, Edward had a, a somewhat dis, dis, 
uh, unsettling childhood, nothing real traumatic, uh, but he has all those key elements that happen to people that inflicts them with creativity, all uh, right? Uh, he had a move in his life, he moved. There was a divorce in his life. The other thing that happens frequently is that there was a death in the family that changes you. Edward didn't have his parents die uh, while he was a child. They died at the normal age that parents do, but um, they did divorce when he was 12. And up to that point, he had moved from apartment to apartment to a rental house to apartment within Chicago, within North Chicago, 11 times. All right, and so when you do this, Every time you do that, your brain as a youngster rewires itself, you know, because you need whole new problem solving skills because uh, you're somewhere else. Edward was skipped through the first grade and he was skipped through the third grade. He was skipped through the fifth grade. So on any given month, he would have been jumped ahead in a new school and a totally different grade his entire life, all the way up to high school. Um, he should have been a wreck. Really, he should have perished, uh, but he really thrived and really socially too. Academically, he would be on and off depending on how bored he was. You know, the, 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 oh, there's one, uh, the letters home from Francis Parker School, which is the high school in Chicago. Sorry to say that Ted has been reported twice since the opening of school, yada, 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 especially uh, um, absent from gym, not surprisingly, and then, uh, Reported last Friday by Mr. Hackett for not working up to his capacity in art. All right. His mom saved these. There's four of these letters that are not complimentary in any way. Um, and his mom saved him. They're like in pristine condition. Um, Edward was bored. However, that Mr. Hackett was his only um, official art training. Otherwise, Edward was self-taught. He learned a lot from that Mr. John Hackett, I think his name was. Uh, that would be the extent of his actual... Uh, art training. Edward went to Harvard after, uh, not exactly after high school. After high school, he had a scholarship to Harvard. He had a scholarship to Yale, a scholarship to Carnegie Mellon, and Chicago School, Northwestern. Uh, but it was also 1943. So actually what happened is as soon as he turned 18, he got drafted. Uh, and he spent a couple years in the Army. When he got out of the Army, like everyone else in 46, uh, he went to Harvard. He chose Harvard because it was the furthest away from his mom. All right, that was pretty much the reason he did it. At, Har at Harvard, Edward took French literature. The reason being, this is how Edward goes through his life. I think he closed his eyes and threw a dart at the class schedule on the wall and it hit French literature and that became his major. All right. Um, Edward would graduate the class of 50. Who else was in his class? There's always famous people. Henry Kissinger was in his class. I think that's it. Um, he would uh, hang out in Cambridge for a couple of years. He would be one of the founders of the Poets Theater, which is a, 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 an absurdist theater group that occasionally springs back to life. But Edward was one of the founders of that over on Brattle Street in Cambridge. Him and Robert Bly, um, Frank O'Hara, who was also his roommate from Harvard, uh, John Chardy, V.R. Lang, a bunch of people. Um, it was absurdist theater, community theater, which meant that not only did you not make any money because it's community theater, but it's absurdist community theater. So you make less than no money on it, all right? And uh, eventually Edward was tired of living off checks from his parents and because uh, he's in his late 20s now. He lost several years in the war. Um, he moves to New York because friends from Harvard um, offer him a job at Doubleday Anchor. Doubleday Anchor was one of the very first paperback divisions. Those books, the books are beautiful. Uh, there are hundreds of them. You still find them everywhere. Uh, if there's a book sale here, they will pop up. If anybody drags books out of their, out of their attic. Um, they were printed by the hundreds and hundreds of thousands for use in college courses, for use in high school courses, and also for people to buy because they were cheap, 95 cents uh, for a classic. Up to this point, all paperbacks were kind of tawdry affairs. You know, they're like manuals on how not to get VD uh, passed out to soldiers. These were uh, classics and essays, and um, uh, they did very well. Edward was the sole art director there for years, even some of his earlier covers. This is where he hones his style. Edward um, begins his life as a professional illustrator right here. He will be a professional illustrator for, like, for the next 47 years, all the way up until his death. He will work a Doubleday Anchor until 62. He will be a creator of children's literature all through the 60s, working for publishers all over New York. He's not books that he wrote. We'll get to those. 
uh, the books that he illustrated for other people. Uh, if you were reading a children's book to someone, to a child, uh, in 1960s, early 70s, or if you were having it read to you, the chances of it being illustrated by Edward were extremely good. He cornered the market on illustration. Um, he worked with all sorts of uh, 70 or 80 different authors doing books that really took up his entire, he was also doing magazine work. And of course, he's also doing Edward Gorey work, uh, which we'll get to in, in a minute. Um, in the 1970s, Edward's day job involved gothic horror. That's what would lead to Dracula. Dracula would lead to WGBH, PBS. That would lead to Edward being the go-to illustrator for uh, murder mysteries and whodunits and things all the way up to his death. He'd be pigeonholed doing those works. He didn't mind those. He loves gothic horror. He loves mysteries. Agatha Christie is his favorite writer, uh, and he likes children's literature. Um, so it wasn't a death sentence, but it was almost a half a century of doing that work. He was esteemed. He was in demand for every one of those decades. He was, in, he was sought after even up to the week he died in 2000. Uh, it's a really long career, and really, it's kind of boring. We don't need to say anything else about it. It's just his day job, all right? What he's really famous for is the thing that, oh, there they are. There's, there's a pile of them. Oh, Edward rose to the rank of art director, which wasn't that hard because there's no one else to be art director, but he would hire all sorts of artists to work there. He hired Maurice Sendak uh, to work at Doubleday. Uh, he hired Andy Warhol to work at Doubleday. He hired Milton Glaser. Saul Bass, Seymour Schwartz, Leonard Baskin, almost every big designer. Doubleday was a big mill that everyone moving to New York went through. It's, it's, what, it's what law and order is to actors who move to New York. Now, everyone gets to play a junkie on law and order or junkie's mom or something. Uh, everyone worked at Doubleday. Uh, and it supported Edward quite well. He got, he got quite a reputation. Um, when he was between jobs, he started getting so much freelance work coming in that he never got another job. It was just freelance. Um, living in New York, um, Edward had a couple ticks uh, about him. First of all, he um, went to movies almost every night. Uh, his journals, which were just for film, uh, record about a thousand films a night. Uh, no, I'm sorry, a year. Uh, in, in your, sometimes 900 films, sometimes a little over. Um, first run films, Saturday morning film series, uh, film societies. Uh, midnight movies. Meanwhile, that seems like, gosh, that's cer certainly somebody who loves film, but that's just, the, uh, uh, that's just the sidebar to what he's actually doing every night, which is going to the New York City Ballet, something that he starts to do as soon as he moves to New York in 1953. By 1955, he is seeing 400 performances a year at the New York City Ballet, which is 412, which is all of them. It's every single performance give or take a musician strike. Uh, he will have five or six season subscriptions for the same season. So he has all these tickets going in uh, second level balcony. If you, went to the, if you watch Balanchine's work at either City Center and then later Lincoln Center, um, Edward was that guy sitting in front of you uh, every night practically. Um, when he became famous from Dracula, there was a um, an urban legend that he had seen every single performance for like the last 30 years or so, which wasn't true uh, because that would have been like 12,644 performances. Edward only has the ticket stubs to 8,241 performances. So kind of a slacker as far as the perfect attendance goes. But he saw more of Balanchine's work than anyone else in the world, except for Balanchine. Edward and Balanchine were not close, even though these are two guys who saw each other every, almost every night. Edward was even invited uh, to the rehearsals uh, for some of the shows, to dress rehearsals, um, to the studio rehearsals. He'd been out drinking with the dancers afterwards. And those 32 seasons, he never spoke a word to George Balanchine. They never uttered a word. Um, meanwhile, this is all this illustration we're talking about. Um, all of that work was merely in place to subsidize, uh, finance Edward's other work, which is Edward Gorey books. Uh, these started coming out as soon as he moved to New York. The Unstrung Harp was published in 1953. Dodd Mead, I think, did it. It's his first book, and it's really the wordiest of his books, really. Um, Edward's books have this in common. They're Edward's books because he writes them, because he illustrates them, because he hand letters them, um, except for the Unstrung Harp, his first book was all typeset. 
And he hated it so much he went back for later printings and hand lettered all the text. And it's like pages and pages of text. Um, these books were published exactly as they were. No editorial comment was ever offered by publishers. Everyone would show them drawings. They'd go, here you go, publish this book. And they would say, no. And he'd go to another publisher. And they would say, no. But a publisher would say, yes. If enough publishers said no, he would publish it himself. He would take it to a print shop and have it printed and sell it at um, a Gotham Book Mart. Um, over the years, Edward would produce a body of work that is 116 published books. Uh, some of them are impossible to find. Uh, some of them are available at almost any gift, any bookstore. Um, not in the libraries. Um, but uh, Edward, let me see what else is coming up here. Unstrung Harp, 1953. Um, Edward would be putting out two, sometimes three books a year, all while doing this full-time illustration work as well. Um, the Doubtful Guest followed about three other books. This came out in 1957. And like all of Edward's books, he considered it a children's book. And really it is. It's, I think the next page has it. It does. Uh, the Doubtful Guest came out, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the Doubtful Guest came out the same year as The Cat in the Hat. Uh, uh, two books that are about the strange character who come in and upend this otherwise staid household. It's the same it's the same explanation for both books. Um, Dr. Seuss made millions off of his. Edward sold 500 copies, perhaps. However, every single person who bought one became a children's book illustrator, all right? It's the uh, velvet underground of children's literature. Maury Sendak, again, Edward's friend, uh, loved that book so much, he really altered his style and attack on children's literature, really because of that book. Um, Edward was influential immediately, even though nobody bought these books. The problem with these books, and with the Gashi Crumb Tinies, for instance, a book from 1960, drew it in 1960. It's published in 1963. Here's the problem with Edward's work. It looks like children's literature, all right? Even the Gashi Crumb Tinies is a seven by seven, looks like a little golden book. Um, but when you open it up, the first page is A is for Amy, who fell down the stairs. And then the next page is B is for Basil, assaulted by bears. Uh, it is a children's book that is not allowed in the children's section of the library. I guarantee you, you walk through there, you would not see that. In fact, all of Edward's books uh, kind of stymie the Dewey Decimal System because they're children's literature that children's librarians hate. Uh, they're um, humor books because they're funny and a weird funny. Uh, but sometimes a laugh out loud, funny. They're art books because they're astonishingly drawn. Look at, look at the cross hatching on those steps. Uh, they're also loaded with, uh, they're layered with imagery and references. Amy going down the stairs is, is drawn almost exactly from uh, the, the Russian silent film Battleship Potemkin. Uh, the, uh, uh, the murder, what's it called, the massacre on the steps of Odessa. He's copying uh, that film for that. He's copying all sorts of stuff. Do you need to know this? Nah, it won't be on the test. Uh, <laughs> he's ripping off Virginia Woolf. Uh, Delmar Schwartz appears in this book. Um, the dedications that he puts in front of his books are always to obscure people that send you off to Google to find out who they were. You know, and sometimes it's his cats. You know, <laughs> Agrippina and what's the other one? Uh, sometimes it's some Irish warrior maiden, they're, they're, they're astonishing. Um, the Ash You Come Tiny is this really iconic book because it's really shocking. Um, and it's also extremely funny. Um, and you're also aware of the fact that you're laughing at this thing that otherwise you would offer thoughts and prayers for. But in fact, in Edward's world, it's hysterical. Uh, and maybe not hysterical, but it's, it is loved by kids. The, the Gory House has a scavenger hunt. Oh, it ends with Z is for Zilla, who drank too much gin. Uh, oh, cautionary tales. Um, at, at the Gory House, we have a scavenger hunt in place for all 26 Gashu Crim Tinies. I thought I had, I think he's coming up. George, smothered under a rug, is the first one you'll find. You'll find Amy on the stairs. Um, it is a good introduction to the house because you look at everything in the house. It's a good introduction to Edward's work which is, there's like no holds barred. He, he, uh, he attacks everyone yeah, equally. Uh, this is from The Water Flowers. Really, it's just in here because I just love it so much. Uh, it shows so many of Edward's influences. Uh, just after the meal concluded, Henry suddenly died. It shows all the influences of a first Japanese um, 
uh, uh, graphics, which Edward, while he was in the army, uh, had an eight month intensive in Japanese language, uh, Japanese culture, art, religion. He was going to be sent to Japan uh, as a cultural liaison you know, during the occupation of Japan, which didn't happen. Uh, and so they disbanded the program, but he had about eight months of just this immersion into Japanese arts, cultures, literature. It, uh, it informs a lot of his, all of his writing and a lot of his graphics, all the use of white area. Edward was also superb at drawing fur. All right? And he had this down when he was a sophomore in high school. He was, he was good at, at drawing fur. Uh, there's just something, there's something beautiful and understated about that. You can see what an influence Edward has been on so many people uh, from Tim Burton to Wes Anderson uh, to um, Daniel Handler working uh, under the name Lemony Snicket and doing all of those books. Uh, those capture, those, those, those books capture the nuances of Edward so beautifully. Um, and Daniel Handler always says, I'm just stealing from Edward Gorey. That's what I do. Uh, Edward was very good at telling you the people that he stole from. Uh, he mentioned all sorts of Japanese writers. The Tales of Ganji was the book he stole from. Uh, Louis Fouillade was a French silent filmmaker that he stole whole scenes from. And he says, look, I stole it from him. Uh, but it's different. Uh, he stole from Edward Lear, Al uh, Agatha Christie, Oscar Wilde, Ronald Fernbank, and George Balanchine a lot, um, and many others. Terry Gilliam steals from Edward. Edward steals from Terry Gilliam first, probably. Um, a lot of the graphics from Monty Python, uh, Edward was looking at and using in his stuff a little bit later on. Meanwhile, Terry Gilliam is looking at Edward when he does Brazil and Time Bandits and things like that. It's a nice give and take. Art is always about the swiping of other people's art and the changing of it. Um, Edward never really made it on, with his own books as a, a creator of children's literature. Only one book of his was published as a children's book, The, the Wuggly Ump. Uh, which is a beautiful piece of nonsense. And really, when you compare it to Grimm's fairy tales or other things, it's not particularly violent. However, the Wuggly um, does devour the three children at the end of the book. And that's about, and that's as, as graphic as the book gets. You see these kids, like they're, they're, like they're in a big thing of blue aspic. And like all of Edward's characters, their, their general expression is, oh, not again, <laughs> you know, I got swallowed by a wuggly ump, which lets you know that it's all, it's, you know, it's all metaphorical. All this, the death of children is always about the loss of innocence and the loss of childhood. I think Edward had a really brutally short childhood, which happens when you start reading adult literature when you're five, Henry James when you're six, Victor Hugo when you're seven, eight. Um, his, his childhood was very brief, and I think he it, that is reflected in a lot of his books, how he treats children. Um, Edward is also a creator of nonsense. Nonsense is a genre. You know, it isn't just goofy ass stuff. It's actually um, one of the more difficult genres of literature. And Edward is one of the big ones. When you look it up, it's like, who's a creator of nonsense, literature and art? It's, it's Edward Lear and Lewis Carroll and Edward Gorey even though he comes 100 years after those guys, uh, 150 in Edward Lear's case. Um, Edward's work delves in, in, in nonsense. It's hard to explain. I always go off, go off on, on tangents when I start talking about nonsense. Um, it, it's just like uh, the word eerie, say, for the, in, in the title of this presentation tonight. Uh, eerie um, isn't necessarily a, a knife and dagger kind of bloody thing. Eerie just means you're in the presence of something you can't explain. And that pretty much is Edward's books, all 116 of them. You're in this presence of something you can't explain. Nonsense uh, uh, is, is all about getting very random th uh, objects uh, and, and placing them in front of you, or people don't respond the way they should uh, to a situation. Um, what usually happens is your brain tries to uh, make sense of it the same way you look at a cloud. And I don't think any other creatures, sentient creatures, do this, but when they look at a who else looks at a cloud and immediately sees a face, you know, or a dragon, or some saint, or a rabbit wearing a top hat? You know, uh, you always are trying, the human brain is always trying to uh, make sense of things that it doesn't understand. When you're looking at the tiling of this floor for just more than a couple of minute moments, you'll see, oh, there's a face. Your brain, if the face isn't there, but your brain is always organizing things 
Uh, and so nonsense does that. Nonsense throws all this weird stuff at you, and it makes you put it together. A lot of people hate that. They want the author to do all the work. And, uh, and Edward's books are really a case of um, the, 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 uh, the reader or the viewer is really in charge of how the narrative unfolds. Hippity Whippity is, again, a case in point. Just a weird book of changing characters coming on and, and nonsense, nonsense text. The Nursery Freeze is another beautiful book. The thing about Edward's books is just when you start to get an interpretation of it, uh, a couple months will pass and you'll go, oh, no, that's not it. Mm -hmm. It's something else entirely. I always hated the nursery freeze. This is a book of Edwards. Uh, it's kind of long like this, and it opens up into a long thing of these characters uh, just running. That's the whole book, each, each time with, with a different word. Um, El Kameda, you know what El Kameda is? El Kameda is the, <coughs> that's the plot that Judas bought with his 30 pieces of silver. Uh, every one of those, uh, uh, words is, is takes you to, to Google to find out what they are. Um, I always hated the book. Uh, just, I thought it was annoying and, and cloy. Uh, Edward said it was his favorite book, probably just to annoy people as well. But when we're going through Edward's collections of photographs, we discover that he has in his collections among thousands and thousands of things. He has a lot of photos by Edward Moybridge. Edward Moybridge, who was Irish, but working in San Francisco. Uh, he's the fellow who photographed th that horse with 30 cameras that had a tripwire on it. Uh, it was all to settle a bet as to whether a horse had all four legs off the ground. It was about by the governor of California and somebody else, uh, Moybridge took the photos. Somebody won the bet. As you can see, all four legs are off the ground. Inadvertently, Moybridge invented photography, uh, invented motion picture by doing this. He would uh, start making these little round circular things with these photos and the lamp inside called a zoetrope. Uh, and you spin it around. And the thing would, it was the first Nickelodeon almost. Um, Edward, knowing that, suddenly we realize that the nursery freeze is actually not a bunch of creatures. It's one creature. And he's supposed to be in motion. Uh, and he's saying all these things. It's advice that he's giving to some infant because it's a nursery freeze. And uh, it just, it's, <laughs> It's, it's lovely. Um, Edward is a master of understatement. He works very hard to write those four words. All right? You have to go through a lot of words before you can get it down to four words, um, which is why Edward says that he hates Henry James more than anyone else in the world, except for Picasso. All right? And this, this beautiful piece from the object lesson, this is also a, a beautiful um, object lesson in how George Balanchine affected Edward's work. When you page through this whole book, there's a few more pages. But here, that wallpaper, that monotony, you know, that, uh, um, the, the, uh, um, what's the word? Um, uh, just the, the suppression, uh, uh, oppressiveness of that wallpaper. That woman stands, her gauntness, those really uncared for flowers in the corner, and that type. It was already Thursday. Um, it just says volumes. Henry James would require 80 pages to get to the same effect of what that drawing did. Um, and some people like that effect of just reading somebody's typing. Uh, but that's a beautiful example of less is more. Uh, another example of how, how much Japanese art influenced Edward. Later on in that book, uh, there's a beautiful sequence of pages. On the shore, a bat or possibly an umbrella disengaged itself from the shrubbery. This is the next page. Then it, crosses, it goes, causing those nearby to recollect the miseries of childhood. Just a lovely book. It's a dance piece, too. Um, Edward's work gets turned into dance extremely easily. All 116 of his pieces, books, uh, work as dance pieces, um, as well as just absurdist uh, um, literature. Um, a few other books. I'm just showing this. This is a wonderful book about um, the Willadell Hancar. Uh, these three people whose relationships you don't really know, they're friends, uh, they find an untended hand car and they start, <laughs> they just take this track. Um, it's, um, it, it shows Edward's immersion into Taoism. This won't be on the test either. Uh, but the fact that all these absurd things happen to them uh, on this quest, uh, and yet they're on a track, which is to say that everything is preordained. It's a, it's a, even though it seems to be a random collection of events in your life, it is a very calculated, random series of events. They're on a track. There's only one way they can go. 
This is the last page because at sunset, they entered a tunnel in the Iron Hills and did not come out the other end. The end. It's such a lovely book. Yeah. The, the, uh, the West Wing <clears throat> is another book of Edwards um, that is totally without text. It's all imagery. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's for you to uh, uh, create the stories. Almost all of it has to do with being in this manor house for the most part, though sometimes it's engulfed in open water. Um, there's apparitions flying around, a floating candle. This one I like, not because of the apparition in the window, but because of that business card in the corner, which Edward places in all of his books, at least once. There is a business card. Sometimes it's fluttering down. You never see what's on it. It's always just a little business card sized business card, you know, and it, it appears in all of his works. It, it's just there. And for no reason other than when it is repeated enough, it, it gets like suddenly we think it means something. Whereas with Edward, he just knew that if you repeat something enough, uh, it, will, it will embed itself with meaning into the viewer. That's also from the, no, that's from the object lesson as well, this beautiful drawing. Edward works in pen and ink. All of Edward's work is done with, um, it's not Gillette, it's a galat nib and many different sizes uh, that he puts into a handle, he dips it into ink, gets it, gets, it, he gets the ink flowing on a piece of scrap paper, and then he draws for however many minutes until the ink flows out. That's how he does everything. That's how he builds his black. Even in here, all the black areas are not filled in black. It is cross-hatching on top of cross-hatching, on top of cross-hatching, on top of cross-hatching. So you always see a little bit of paper coming through. It gives so much depth uh, uh, to his drawings. Um, in the 1980s, uh, uh, Gelat, Gelat, uh, stopped producing the nibs, and Edward was beside himself. And he bought as many as he could uh, in New York, uh, and um, eventually he ran out of them, and he had to switch to a new nib uh, called Titcomb, uh, which are still around. And he says, from that point on, I never really enjoyed drawing as much. Uh, such a creature of habit, so sad. Um, when Edward moves to the house, there's a house. This is a house in Yarmouthport right here in the bulging uh, bicep of the Cape. Uh, uh, it is surrounded by really nice houses. And then we have this kind of gray thing uh, that Edward purchased. He bought it um, from money from Dracula. Uh, Dracula, lest we forget, was a big deal on Broadway in 1977 when it opened. And Edward was uh, um, alone among all set and costume designers, which he wasn't really one of either of those, but they wanted him to do it uh, because he had he had done it first for Nantucket Theater, uh, Dracula. Um, uh, it is, Dracula is a show that is known for its design and almost nothing else. It's not a musical. There's nothing catch, no catchy tunes. Uh, nobody got acting awards. It was all just about the look of the show. And when that thing opened up in 1977, uh, people flocked to it. I think there was, had been a dearth of really good shows to see. Uh, in the 1970s, unless you're a Sondheim fan. There's nothing to see in, in Times Square. Uh, Dracula was the first thing that brought everybody in. It would be followed three years later by Cats would open up immediately after. Uh, Evita would open up. So there's always been a blockbuster. Dracula was really, Dracula was really the first blockbuster um, like that. Um, I think there's more pictures of that coming up. Maybe not. Um, Edward purchased a house in 1979 because um, with Dracula, he was getting percentages of ticket sales, unheard of for a costume set designer. Uh, that show sold out in 78, 79, 80. It opened in London. It toured North America for six years. It toured Australia. Uh, Everyone got 5.3% on every single seat. That was sad. Uh, yeah, well done. Uh, he was suddenly a millionaire, multi-millionaire. Like not a lot of millions, but more than two, you know, maybe more than three maybe less than five, um, he bought a house. I think his bookkeeper says, oh, you gotta buy a house. Uh, so he did. Um, and uh, he bought this house pretty much sight unseen. He looked through the door, which had a little pointer. On the porch here, there was a little side door. It was the only door that wasn't covered in poison ivy and he looked inside of it and he saw a fireplace with this urn carved into the mantelpiece. And he goes, I'll buy it. Um, he did not know uh, that that fireplace was the only source of heat for the entire house. 
uh, or that the house also contained about 30 raccoons because uh, no, none of them walked by while he was looking in. But he looked through that side door and he went to the real, to the real estate office in Barnstable and wrote a check for a house. Uh, it would take six years and that means six years of royalty checks to really to fix up the house uh, for, for Edward. And he would move in in 1985, at the end of 85. Um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, he got kicked out of his apartment in New York because uh, it was a studio apartment. You would fit four of them in the space right here. Um, it was rent controlled and somebody squealed on him. They found out that he owned a house in Yarmouthport. So that violates rent control agreements in Manhattan, apparently. Uh, seems like it should. Uh, so he got kicked out. Also, um, George Balanchine had died in 1984. And so there's no more ballet that Edward had to see. Um, if, as long as Balanchine was alive, Edward stayed in New York to see it uh, multiple times. Um, and Balanchine was doing less and less stuff through the 80s. He was getting sick. Um, but, you know, as I said, Edward saw 400 shows a year in the 50s. In the 60s, he saw 170, 180 shows a season. In the, uh, um, 70, in the 70s, more money coming in, he saw 200 shows. Uh, in the 80s, he saw about 30 because Balanchine was not doing that much work, but he had to be around uh, to do it. Edward filled the house with things, primarily books. Uh, this is what is now the kitchen upstairs. Um, oops, there he is at the end. I'll go back to that. Um, Edward filled it with 26,000 books, 26,244. Um, all those books are at San Diego State University now. Edward's time at the Cape seemed to be like hanging out at the diner up the street constantly uh, or at uh, Parnassus Books. Uh, which was between his house and Jack's diner. Uh, but in fact, Edward was, uh, and also he seemed to be watching TV at night because he never had a TV before. Uh, suddenly he would be enamored of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and X-Files and Doctor Who and things. Um, all these things say, uh, attest to a man in his retirement years. But in fact, Edward was a full-time illustrator still. He was doing work for the New Yorker, or doing work for... Sports Illustrated, TV Guide, every issue of TV Guide through the 80s and 90s up to 2000, uh, Home and Garden, New Yorker, New York Review of Books. He was everywhere, plus all the book design. Um, he was in hundreds of anthologies because people wanted to use him uh, for books about cats and authors, dogs, animals. Um, he was also doing his own work, Edward Gorey books. Those were coming out one or two a year. He was also doing puppetry, doing absurdist theater on the Cape uh, with people in... Um, uh, P-Town, there's a troupe up there working with people in Woods Hole, working with Cape Rep, Katuit Center for the Arts. So his life had a beautiful bookend um, where he started as a young adult working at the Poets Theater. Uh, at the end of his life, he was doing absurdist theater uh, again, and he didn't really need to worry about money. Really, Dracula left it, so he didn't really need to work, or he could be very selective. Uh, but the plays, he did about 20 plays. He was working on The White Canoe, his puppet opera when he had a heart attack uh, in April of 2000, and he passed away, just like that. That's what eating a Jack's out back twice a day for 15 years will do to you, all right? That and lack of sleep. Because in addition to all that work, Edward was also working on etchings, and lots of etchings. Um, because he didn't enjoy drawing, he had moved into using like dental tools and was working on copper plates. Now, he had met a woman in Brewster who was uh, producing prints from those plates, and there's a lot of them. He has like 200 plates. Uh, that he was doing. He was also collecting like a madman. His house is, is just a wonder comer of stuff. He was also doing fabric arts. That's what he did while he was watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He was so, hand sewing these dolls, filling in with Uncle Ben's rice. Thousands of them that he did. He gave them as pre as he, in payment to his actors, uh, generally. He was doing string art. He was doing, um, working on his Mac classic, doing animations. He was doing needlepoint. Crazy busy uh, for a man that age, just blossoms into all these directions. Uh, he would have just kept going had his heart not given out. Um, he died in April 2000. As you can see, if you do the math, he was 75 years old. He wasn't very old, really. Old enough uh, that he looked old. Uh, old enough, though, you can, we can say he didn't die young. Uh, but he, he could have done a lot of stuff. He did, however, produce probably 800 books for other authors. Uh, I don't think that even includes the Doubleday stuff. 116 of his own books, 217 plates, etchings. There are 75 finished manuscripts in the archives. 
Um, plus there are piles and piles of drawings at the archives that we don't even know what they go to. They're just piles of beautiful drawings uh, and book covers to books we didn't even know about. Um, the archives are, are New York. Edward passed away and in his will, he left uh, all his artwork to uh, a charitable trust. They would handle the licensing and royalties. They give that money out to animal welfare groups uh, every year, the same groups that Edward gave money to every year starting in like 1979, when that money from Dracula started coming in. He gives money to Boston Animal Rescue League, Brewster Animal Shelter, the Bat Conservancy, the Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee, Zero Seas Society, I Fall, Wild Care. There should be about five more. Um, Edward is writing checks to these people. Oops. Um, for much of his life and when he died, now the trust uh, continues to write checks to them. Um, his art collection that he amassed in the house, he had a lot of Edward Moybridge uh, photos. He had uh, um, uh, um, Edvard Munch, he had Balthus, he had Edward Lear prints, thousands of photos and things. All that stuff he willed to the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. They took about 100 of the really good pieces because uh, Edward's art collection also encompasses a lot of yard sale art and paint by numbers and black velvet, uh, Jesus's and stuff. Um, we still have that stuff. Um, so I should shut up there. Uh, the house, everything in the house still, uh, it's filled, though much cleaner than when Edward was there. Um, it's still filled with cats. We have two cats, not the six cats that Edward had, but uh, it has the cats. Uh, it's missing the books, but everything else in it was either worn by, carried in or drawn by Edward. Really, so um, it's, a, it's a good immersion into his life. As I said, this year, we look at fashion and costuming, both Edward's fashion, which was pretty elaborate, uh, and also the costuming that he, put his, that he drew his characters into uh, as well. So I've talked long, long enough. Oh, yeah. Um, do we have any questions? A question in the front. Well, I, I have a comment and, Comments. and a question. So uh, over the summer, we, my wife and I have a mutual friend who does a big summer party, themed summer party. And this year he did an Edward Gorey oh, yeah. party. And so we could go as Edward Gorey characters. And I went as the unexpected guest. The, the doubtful wife, guest. Yes, yeah, the doubtful the guest. Right, the doubtful guest. Mm -hmm. And um, my wife found a uh, hazmat suit on Amazon, <laughs> a white hazmat suit. And she came home with four giant... Uh, Sharpie markers, and it took me the whole week to yeah. cross it. It was wonderfully therapeutic, yes. but I could only do it for X amount of hours a yeah. day. So, I mean, I mean, his energy level was downright Victorian. I mean, you yeah, it was crazy. Patience. His work, and his work is small. Yeah. When you look at his works, every one of those drawings you would have looked at uh, is about five by four. Right. Uh, the, the long, yeah. the horizontal ones would be slightly longer, but. Sh um, so there's only X amount of space to fill, but he works fast and he has a lot of control. I look at his work, I, I scan it and I blow it up, enlarge it thousand percent sometimes to, to do outlines and looking at those lines and he, it's, it's, it's where the line ends against another line, it's right there. I mean, if he makes a mistake, he's not above using whiteout to, pit, to fix a few things. He fixes type a lot. Um, um, his application of whiteout is almost as impressive. He could, he could, he, I've seen a little bit of whiteout on the, on the dot of an eye that he didn't like and he fixed it. So his hand-eye coordination, his eyes uh, were pretty remarkable. But he works very fast and he works very, uh, um, very focused. Uh, so whatever drawing you look at of his, either there or at the house, you know that is not the only thing he did that day. You know, he had to go to a movie. He had to go to the ballet. He had a piece for the New Yorker that was due the day before, or you know, a piece or somebody's book cover they're waiting for. Is he'd do four or five things in a day. Maybe not finish all of them, but he have to go back and forth. Plus, he reads a couple books a week. It's just crazy amount of energy. Um, so, but my my question. Oh, question. Um, so I, I I'm interested to know about the exhibits that the the, the museum does, um, and just like from kind of. Start to finish from, you know, when you conceive, okay, this is what the next exhibit is going to be. Mm -hmm. How long would it take you to sort of, you know, arrange it, plan it, and, and lay it all out? And do you have, like, the exhibits kind of conceived and planned for, like, 2024? We do. We have, I have them all planned out 
for a couple of years in advance. It depends on what happens. Next year is being worked on. Okay. Um, usually I would start writing a piece, writing the exhibit, get the approval and start writing in September, October, uh, and, and be writing while doing everything else. We go to the trust after the new year to return the old artwork and pick up the new artwork. So really all our artwork comes from one source. You know, if you had to get artwork from other museums on loan, that's years of paperwork and, and stuff. We're very fortunate we have stuff upstairs or I just go down to New York, always in person, go to New York to the archives and carry back artwork. And they're very amendable to the house taking artwork. So um, when the house closes in after December 31st, uh, that exhibit that's there now comes down and uh, we start within a month, we start assembling the new one. Uh, and it takes about three months. The house will be closed three months. So, yeah, they're good exhibits. They're, they're, they keep it interesting for everyone who works at the house and for the docents. And it also means people come back every year because it's really a different, talking about a totally different thing every year. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have anything? To, yes. Why is his influence so I mean, look at it, and that, that was the thing. Yeah. It was from a much different era. It's, it's um, par part of it has to do with the literature he read as a kid, which was a lot of 19th century literature, you know. Um, I think he settles on this time period, and mostly, when you start looking at it, it's actually Edwardian. Mm -hmm. uh, there is Victorian in there. You get the hourglass, hourglass skirts on women, uh, but like that really long, slender woman against, a lot of that is Edwardian, where the, the, the silhouette gets really thin. The men's suits are essentially suits that we wear now uh, with narrow trousers. He likes that time period from 1901 to 1914. It's the Edwardian time period. We like to think it's named after him. Uh, but also, that, that time period is um, where the past and the modern collide. Everything changes right there. Uh, you know, from hoop skirts and some guy with a horse is dropping off your milk to looking up and a plane flies over. All happened simultaneously. You know, uh, literature breaks down, uh, art starts to break down, literally, you know, cubism and, and uh, dance, uh, music with Stravinsky. Everything starts changing in that time period. Uh, everything becomes the modern. Like, there was no present. It went from the past to the modern, literally overnight, like on a Tuesday. You know, uh, all of Edward's characters look like they're, they're aware of the fact that they're the past. That, that all that look in their face is like, shit, I'm overdressed and, my, and I'm irrelevant, you know? And, and it's funny because Edward asks you to do the same thing right now. You know, the, 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 the takeaway from that is, it's like, are we already the past now? That's how he's kind of talking about it uh, to us. You never know when you're the past until you look behind you and there's nobody there then you know that you're last, you know? So he, he has a message in there using that time period because it's distant enough to seem quaint, you know, but not that distant. You know, it still has all the intrigue and murder and love affairs and, and, and stuff to make it feel real. Uh, so that's why he likes it, I think, if I could speculate. Yeah, I have up here, if you find it on your way out, uh, some brochures for this year's show, has our hours which are basically Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, but it has pictures in it, too. Feel free to take one of those. Yeah. How yeah. long have you been curious? Uh, it'll be 10 years in a few months. In December, it'll be 10 years. Was it something you sought out? Or no, I was hired by the, by the director because <laughs> I could carry boxes of books up the stairs. <laughs> they're steep stairs, and the boxes are heavy. And so if I could carry 50 pounds of books, I had the job. Uh, <laughs> Did, and, did you have a strong interest in him? Before? No, no, not at all. Wow. No, but um, the house, and I'm really the first generation running the house and many of the docents now who weren't friends of Edwards, really. Uh, Rick Jones, who ran the house, was a very good friend of his. He was with him when he died. Um, our last docent who knew Edward is Ski, Ski Morton. She's Edward's cousin. Uh, she hasn't been there last couple months because she hurt her hips because she must be thousands of years old, but uh, she gives really good tours. She gets to call him Ted. Uh, she is essentially Edward's younger sister. It is in their house, her and her sister Eleanor, that Edward lived every summer uh, for 30 years, almost, until he moved into the house in Yarmouth. Uh, 
Uh, their house was in Barnstable. So we did, there's that connection. And now the connection is disappearing. Those people are starting to pass away. Um, but I came to the house and I could do design. I'm a writer. I could talk in front of people, which I do all day. Um, I could do graphic design because that's what I did. So I had all the tools they needed for this museum. Uh, and so it's, it, it shows, you know, it has a really nice consistency to it, the tone and manner of how it's done. So I'm happy about that. Because you've got that, you're in a house. Yeah. And the space is limited. You don't have big galleries. No. Nope. We've been to a couple of the, the exhibits and it's always really well used. The yeah, space really every well space. Used. Yeah, you, you try to lean something against the wall. It's really hard because every piece of wall is taken. Yeah, you have to start, the rooms are set up. There's old hallways that can't, things can't be moved, really. Um, we're going to have new cases next year. Uh, we had a grant, so, but they're just going to be shinier versions of the cases that we have, uh, maybe with lighting inside. Uh, but yeah, there's like a kitchen. You have to go down the hallway. There's a back room. So it's, a, it's an interesting palette of one, two, three, four, five rooms in a hallway to play with uh, every year. It's really exciting. Yeah. Did you ever have any relationship he liked cats. <laughs> cats were his intimacy. No, he didn't. And you know, we're not, we're, we don't, we, we don't like put any blinders on us saying, no, we don't want to hear about any relationships. We, we want to hear somebody come out of the closet and say, I slept with Edward, but no one ever has. He didn't, he was too busy. Uh, and who would, a man who had 26,000 books, six cats. Um, that was maybe one of the quirks from his childhood, perhaps, that, that kind of breaking of intimacy by moving all the time. But that's just my kind of arm, armchair psychology a little bit. He was capable of, um, he's eccentric, but not at the expense of wanting to be around him. He was really pleasant, funny, and generous man. Um, and I don't know how he smelled. I don't know all these little things that uh, what would like to know. I just I mean, it smelled good. Um, he had close friends. He was devoted to his family to Ski, his cousin and Eleanor, and to Ken, uh, Ski's son. They're extremely close. He had long, lifelong friends. And as a 60-year-old man, when he moves to Yarmouthport full-time to move into the house, he makes new lifelong friends, which is really hard to do when you're 60 years old, uh, older. Uh, he just walked into Jack's out back, and he knew everybody there within a year or so. That launched him into all these other projects, really. So he was capable. I think that comes also from childhood, from being thrown into a strange classroom and either adapt or perish. So I think if you threw him in a desert island or with some tribe, some headhunting tribe, he'd probably flourish, you know, <laughs> or be eaten, I guess, either way. But, yeah. So, oh, yeah, one more. Did he have a favorite drink? I don't know. Um, I asked if he was a big drinker to Rick, uh, and he goes, and Rick would say, well, he drank whatever was put in front of him. <laughs> I think mostly left to his devices, he drank tea uh, for, for the mild uh, caffeine that it gave him, because of course he couldn't sleep more than three hours a night easily, you know? He couldn't have slept more than three hours a night to get that work done. Um, but whatever was placed in front of him, he would drink. And then if you placed another one, he would continue to drink it. And so, yes. Yeah. Good question, though. Well, folks, I should let you go to get on with your life. If you have any more questions, come see me uh, uh, over here. I'll be hanging out for a few minutes. Take a brochure if you like. Uh, come by and visit the house. If you don't make it this year, we open again in April with a, a new exciting show. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your time. <laughs>